Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm Paul Schuler. I'm going to chair this session. I'm not George or Dave. Um, uh, we're going to do self introductions mostly during the, these sets of meetings. And in my own case, I'm the uh, former president of Clean Caribbean and Americas, and I'm the director of external affairs for OSRL in the Americas. <coughs> Uh, I'm going to start with a little little narrative uh, because I started at Clean Caribbean in November of 1991, and uh, there were three of us who started together as the first permanent staff. And in January 1991, uh, we were actually it was a Friday evening. We were there a little late at 5:30 when we got a call from someone in Grand Bahama Islands where there are a couple of, there's a refinery and a transshipment center. And uh, I, the call was that uh, there's a, a vessel went aground, the Al Alexander's ability. It was, it was not a tanker, uh, but there was threats of an oil spill. And the government turned to the local company and said, you're the ones who know about oil, so you take care of this. Um, and so we started mobilizing equipment and sending it over to the Bahamas. Uh, I, I knew the, the guy over there very well from previous life. And uh, at one point he called me up and said, Paul, you're killing me. <laughs> I said, what, what, do you, what do you mean I'm killing you? He said, you're, you're sending the, uh, the equipment list with values on all the equipment um, and uh, the government's forcing me to, to file a bond for all the, uh, the uh, uh, a customs bond. And he said, I'm, I'm about run out of, he says, well, you got to do something. And I said, well, frankly, I can't ship anything without listing what's there and the value. And uh, <coughs> so you need to go to the government and ask them for a waiver. And that's what was done. And from that experience, I learned at my second month in the job that this job has more to do, a, a lot more to do with than just boom and skimmers. That there's a whole world out there that we have to work in to, to make things happen. And uh, part of what we're going to talk about now is the dispersion side of things. And some of the things that go on uh, re regarding uh, the, the, the use or the planned use uh, of, of dispersants. Um, another short allegory is that when I took over, uh, we were really the only dispersant capability in North America uh, with some, uh, some capability in Alaska. And so the first thing I realized was uh, that for the United States, we had NOAA and this uh, uh, scientific support group, and they provided all kinds of advice on technologies and methodologies of response. But in the Caribbean and Latin America, there was no one. And because we were the ones who had the equipment, we are being asked, well, what can you do? And, and so we had to get smart on dispersants and, and be very knowledgeable so that we could act in, in the, as a good advisor to countries and, and entities that were uh, considering that shoes. So that takes me to here. Um, we've had a, a slight change of order, but uh, we're going to have Dave Reddington and, and George Stafford talk about where we stand today as kind of a ground zero for now to, to place us uh, in the, in the dispersant uh, uh, current status. Uh, I'm going to have uh, each of, we've got about 20 minutes each, uh, about, but about 15 minutes, well, uh, you'll get the five minute sign. And uh, if you can close, we can have some Q and A that, um, after that, we're going to have Tim Steffick from API and uh, talk about some of the regulatory challenges with dispersants. Uh, then John Belk from DASICS 
So we'll talk about manufacturing supply chain issues. Uh, Mike Drew from Oxy is going to talk about IOGP's uh, dispersion task force. That's the International Oil and Gas Producers, and he can tell you more about that. Uh, I'll come back for a very short five minutes or less on the tropics experiment and field study. And then if we have some time, we'll have a, a, some group Q&A at, at the end. So having said that, I'm gonna ask for you to do a quick uh, self introductions and, and you've got it. Okay, should we take it away? Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Paul. Um, so as Paul said, my name is George and this is my colleague, Dave. And hopefully we're just, just going to provide a little bit of context around this person because we've got some really interesting talks later on from um, Tim and Mike about some of the challenges that are facing the industry at the moment. But hopefully this just will give a bit little reminder to everyone as to why dispersants is such an important tool in um, response to an oil spill. So um, I'll, I'm going to take probably the first 10 minutes. I think we've got 20 minutes between us. Um, and then Dave, I'm going to hand over to my colleague Dave. So I'll just allow Dave to introduce himself. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Dave. Um, I'm not quite as youthful as uh, young George here. So I've, been, <laughs> I've been around for a bit, so I've, I've known quite a few of you here, and you've probably met in the past. So yeah, I've been with the company about 16 years now, and the eyes and ears of the ground, looking at all the dispersant stocks, uh, whether it, whichever company it might come from. Um, so you can share some of that information, with Sean. Cool, so just um, a little bit about myself before we get started. Um, I've been with OSRL for about five, six years now. Um, most of that time has been sent, spent in response, but I've recently joined the dispersant team um, at OSRL. So a quick look at the agenda for today. Uh, we're gonna start on just some very basic why we use dispersants. This is gonna be quite familiar to a lot of you, I'm sure, um, but it'll hopefully frame a bit of uh, the discussions that are gonna go on later on then dip into um, some of the application systems that we use both at OSRL and as an industry as a whole. Uh, then I'm going to just talk about some of the stockpiles that are currently available. Um, and those are both OSRL stockpiles and the stockpiles um, that the industry has as a whole. And then I'm going to pass you over to Dave to talk about some of the logistical challenges that there can be in the case of a large mobilisation if you're trying to move those stockpiles to wherever they need to be. And then he's going to um, follow that just by talking a bit about some of the work we do to make sure that our stockpiles maintain their efficacy over a prolonged period of storage. OK, so um, why do we use dispersants? Um, ultimately, dispersants make up um, one option out of many options when we're responding to an oil spill. And there are some situations where that's probably going to be the best option. And there are probably some situations where it's not going to be the best option. But um, it does provide some advantages over some, uh, perhaps, containment recovery. And containment recovery, I think, often by people who aren't familiar with the industry, is um, intuitively seen to be a good way to respond, because you're taking that oil out of the environment. But obviously it has its limitations, because historically you're only ever going to get maybe up to a maximum of 10% of the oil out of the environment if you're doing that and if you're trying to protect some particularly sensitive shorelines or particularly sensitive environments um it would obviously be ideal to <coughs> um, do a bit better than that so dispersant has a real advantage over some of those other um, response techniques for some of the reasons that are listed up there so response speed um it can be applied by aircraft which means you can respond to really remote places in a relatively short time scale when compared to vessels um, you can target a really wide um, area. So if you've got big slick, you can target, um, cover a, a really wide area compared to conventional containment recovery techniques. Uh, and another big advantage is it can be um, deployed subsea. So as it says there, the um, reason that that is good is you can do it 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You're not necessarily impacted by the constraints of weather. Um, and you can target a really high proportion of the oil at the source. <coughs> also can make it a lot safer for some other response options at the surface if you're producing the volatile hydrocarbons. So that's a bit of background as to why we use this person. We could go into a lot more detail, but I'm aware that there's a lot of very experienced people um, here. So just a little refresher. 
So this is a picture, I believe, of Macondo. Um, I think before any dispersants had been used. And you can see there's a couple, well, there's some small vessels there doing a very valiant job of um, conducting some containment and recovery operations. But I've just included this photo just to kind of give a sense of where containment and recovery can be um, a great option, but also sometimes dispersants can be a, be, um, a good option as well. And so ultimately, it always comes down to a net environmental benefit analysis, what's going to actually be best in the long term. And I think Paul's maybe going to touch on a study later on, the Tropic study, which probably feeds into this um, quite nicely as to the long term advantages that dispersant can give um, as opposed to not using them. Just um, a very short kind of case study. Uh, this is an example of a situation where dispersants might be um, possibly the best option. <coughs> You've got some particularly sensitive areas that you might be looking to protect. So that could be um, mangroves or wetlands where if the oil were to make an impact, that's going to be really difficult to clean. Um, and if you can avoid that at all costs, then that's going to be advantageous. The oil is in um, nice deep water. And so this is a case where dispersant could be um, one of those tools in your toolkit that you would want to, to use in the case of a response. So hopefully that just gives a bit of background. So when we're talking later on about some of the issues that face the industry, this is the reason why it's so important that we have access to dispersant in the event of um, an incident, because it is a really, really valuable tool in our toolkit. So moving on next, we're just going to dip into um, the different application systems that we have at OSRL. Um, you can probably split that into four main categories. You've got boat spray systems, spray arms, which are quite similar. You've got active boom systems um, and aerial application systems. So boat spray systems, um, at OSRL we use um, commonly a FIDO nozzles. And these nozzles are um, specifically engineered to get um, the required droplet size of dispersant for maximum efficacy. And this is a really good piece of equipment because it's very versatile. You can put it on pretty much any vessel, whether it be small or big. Um, it's relatively small. You can um, transport it where you want to. And so it's a really, really good option. Um, spray arms work in a very similar way. Uh, arguably, they um, can provide slightly more even distribution and maybe a slightly wider swap width. But obviously, they have the disadvantage that they're a little bit less versatile. You often need to... Um, weld them onto a vessel or they need to be pre-fitted to the vessel. So they are a great option, but um, just another, another option that you can have. Active boom systems, um, certainly something that I've come across less commonly um, used in anger in, in my experience. But these are um, obviously probably a bit more expensive than the other pieces of equipment, but they have the advantage that you're going to have a much wider encounter area. So the way that these work is you would um, allow the oil to funnel into the apex of the boom where you would then um, apply the dispersant. So it's a bit more um, of a wider encounter area, but it, but it does have the associated disadvantages that you find with containment and recovery in that it's a bit slower and a bit um, more difficult to deploy. And then finally, you've got um, aerial application systems, which um, do provide a lot of those advantages that we spoke about earlier. You can get them on scene a lot quicker. You can cover a lot um, wider areas. So it can either be fixed wing aircraft. So in the case of oil spill um, response, we've got a couple of aircraft, which I'll talk about just in a second. Or you can have um, maybe a, a heli bucket system, which is um, slung underneath the helicopter. And that can be advantageous because you can be a bit more precise over where you're targeting. You can if you've got a slip that's broken up, you can perhaps target those individual areas, which might be more difficult to do with a fixed wing system. So in terms of OSRL's aerial capability, we have two Boeing 727s, which are currently based in South End UK. Um, they're great because they've got a really um, large range. So you can see that 2,500 nautical miles and they can carry up to 15 metres cubed of dispersant at any one time. Um, obviously, if you're carrying dispersant, that range is slightly reduced, but um, we have dispersant also based in South End, so we can load it up before we fly if we need to. <clears throat> and similarly, we have uh, Hercules based in Malaysia, which um, 
has a slightly less range, slightly lower capacity, but again, provides much many of the advantages that that 727 aircraft um, provides as well. So that's the application system, just as a bit of background. And I'm now going to move on to talking about OSRL's stockpiles and also the global stockpiles, which are currently available worldwide. So at OSRL, we have kind of three distinct stockpiles, which can be a little bit confusing. But essentially, we have the SLA stockpile, or the Service Level Agreement stockpile. And what that means is that anyone who is a member of OSRL will have access to this. So that's 750 metres cubed, which are stored in a variety of different locations around the world. Um, you've got some over in Fort Lauderdale. We've got some here in Southampton at our base. Uh, some in Bahrain and some in Singapore. So it's got quite a wide global footprint should that be needed. But then on top of that, we also have the global dispersant stockpile, which is a subscription service, but that gives access to anyone who is subscribed um, to a lot, uh, a much bigger stockpile, that's 5,000 metres cubed. And um, to subscribe to that, the members pay a annual subscription, which is proportional to the risk that they have. <coughs> And that stockpile, again, is in a number of different locations globally, so that um, we kind of look to cover the whole, whole world. So Port Lauderdale, Rio, Cape Town, Singapore, and Battery in France. And the third one that OSRL has is the, um, the UK Dispersant in Inventory, which, again, is a subscription service that our UK members can sign up to, and that will give them access to 500 metres cubed of dispersant which is located up um, towards the north of England, where most of the risk in the UK is based. So that is our OSRL stockpiles. But on top of that, there are obviously a number of um, organisations throughout the world who have their own stockpiles. And one of the things that we've um, done within OSRL is to try and create um, a database of all those stockpiles globally, so that if... Um, anyone were to have an incident and they were looking for a reference as to what this person is available in the local area, then they can refer to that and hopefully it will give them a starting point. Um, I would say that this is obviously to the best of our knowledge and we don't know what we don't know, so there might be other stockpiles available, but this is to the best of our knowledge, um, the kind of larger stockpiles that we're aware of. And um, this is publicly, publicly available, so if anyone were to go on that link there, or if you just type in um, Global Dispersant Inventory OSRL on Google, it'll be probably the first thing that pops up. And uh, yeah, anyone can have access to that. And I'd just say that if, if anyone is aware of any stockpiles that uh, perhaps not on here, or you think might not be on here, then certainly it would be much appreciated if you guys could let us know, because then we can try and keep this as up to date as possible um, to be used by the industry. Just, just to add. Just to add to that, a, we've got about 20,000 cubes uh, logged on the system at the moment. So the a couple of caveats, that's, it's not really a service, it's just a, a stock um, sort of, um, uh, well, num numbering system. So a couple of caveats is if you or any, anybody required uh, access to any of the stocks or source of stocks, if there's a large incident sort of locally, uh, and Osro stocks were exhausted, so this, this system kind of uh, backs up Dilsro stocks or tier one stocks, etc. So the caveats with that really are we can't guarantee what, what state the actual uh, dispersants in and we can't guarantee that the owner of that stock is going to allow you access to that stock. It's just there. And obviously industry being industry, I'm sure a lot, a lot of companies would allow or try to sell some of the stocks. With, and also with the stocks starting to age now, uh, some of the owners would be quite keen to sort of you know, refresh their stock, so they might, might want to sell. So, yeah, just a couple of caveats. Mm, thank you. Uh, thanks, Dave. I'm going to pass over to you in a second, um, anyway, I think. So um, that's my bit, just to give a bit of framing for um, dispersants as a whole, why we use them, what there currently is out there. I'm going to pass over to um, Dave, who's just going to go through some of the logistical challenges that can be had when we're trying to mobilise all of those thousands of tons of dispersant in the event of an incident. Thanks, George. Just um, on the list of planning, I mean, George touched base on this um, earlier. So if you need to apply 
disbursements, you need to be quite serious about it, whether it be tier one, tier two, or tier three levels. So you need the right people, the right equipment, uh, exercising, et cetera, and the stocks and resupply. So um, with, around sort of tier two, tier three level uh, OSROs or operators, um, we need to manage the actual usage of the disbursement. So this is just one of our sort of basic uh, planning tools. It's, a, it's called a logistics usage plan. Um, we use this uh, on a few exercises we've done internally and, and we share it with some of the members who, who, who potentially might be using a lot of dispersing. So it really is it's just to give us an idea or plan um, how to um, mobilise dispersing based on where it's located, uh, the freight to, to the, 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 the lay down area uh, and what's being used. So it could be vessels or, or aviation uh, or, or, or subsea injection, etc. So. It just, it just, it's just a tool for us to, to, to plan the movements of dispersant to this particular location. So it's, it's, it's only a spreadsheet, it's got a few graphs in there, but it's a good planning tool. So if anybody would like uh, us to share that with you, we're more than, more than welcome to share that, that spreadsheet with you. So resupply. So my analogy here is a, is a, a pandemic in the UK. So it's our affiliation with. Um, uh, eggs or even toilet roll. So, so there's obviously um, we have stockpiles; uh, they're ready to go. But then the, the supply, there's there's always a, a lag with the supplies. So once the stockpiles be, become exhausted, if there's a large incident, particularly uh, a subsea injection incident, for example, that could exhaust, for example, the global dispersal stockpile within a matter of a couple of weeks. So what we need to do is is, is keep an eye on on uh, on numbers we've got, what we can bolster up with, with, whether it be the global dispersal inventory, which George alluded to earlier. Uh, and then it just gives you an idea of the, the time timings of, of resupply from the likes of Daisy, for example, Total and, and Corexit. Um, so there is there is a lag, um, particularly if you have a large incident, there's going to be a high demand for some of the key key components of, of the, those particular dispersants. And if all three or maybe more um, suppliers are making a uh, dispersant to bolster up an incident, then some of the key components will be exhausted uh, in, a, in a short uh, time. So at the moment, there's a couple of timings there, 12 weeks lead time, obviously correct, uh, the Champion X products is currently un unavailable, but both Daisy and the Total products um, are both about 12 week, 12 week lead time. And that depends on, on the, the moment that it's required. Um, I'm sure John will, will, will come on to that later on. Um, the cost of dispersion isn't cheap. So the da Daisy products currently around 5,200 UK pounds. The Finisol is around 8,000 euros per, per IBC. And um, Champion Edge products, that's the most expensive one. That's around 12,000 uh, US dollars per, per metric tonne. So it's not cheap. Uh, and I'll go on to, to the ma managing of that shortly. So stop by readiness. So one of the questions we do get asked by particularly the OSRO members is how long will the dispersant last for and what condition it's in? So, um, so what we try and do, luckily, fortunately, for, for an OSRO or OSRO like, like ourselves, uh, we've got the people and the time and, and, and the finances to manage it, to look after it. So um, a few years ago, we, we had various stockpiles around the world and we used different types of IBCs or totes, as they call it, in, in, the, in the US. Um, on, on top of the IBC that's capped, some had vents that bent out, some had vents that bent in. Uh, some were four millimetres thick, some were six millimetres thick, some were different types of material. Uh, and, and we did um, a test on one, I think it's an old dispersion, uh, 1980s type dispersion, um, and it was actually, we were losing solvent. We measured it every year, and the solvent was being lost, albeit a couple of millimetres, so over a you know, 20 years, you could lose a substantial amount of that formulation. So, so we spoke to uh, John and, and, and Steve at, at Daisy. We spoke to Schutz, the manufacturer. We spoke to some of the some of the uh, oil companies, and we, we worked out what we needed. Or the ideal uh, container was this EVOH. Uh, this is basically a six-layer IBC, which prevents any permeation through the actual IBC, uh, and with, without any vents from the camp seal. So. So, um, and also the, the headspace and the top of the IBC is about 60 litres of headspace. 
so sometimes that, that oxygen gets absorbed into the surfactants and it causes low pressure and it, it sort of falls in on itself. So what we do now is, is do a nitrogen nitrogen blanketing. So once we've transferred it into the new IBC, the nitrogen blanket that top space to give it a nice inert environment to live. Um, there was a process that, that uh, Daisy were using and we tried it and it does work really, really well. So the efficacy testing, so looking at the, um, uh, the basically it's the health of the dispersant. Um, so like I said, the big question is how long is it going to last for us? So what we do every five years, we do a, a quick um, efficacy test of 10% of each batch. Uh, and then we send it over to, over to the lab and do an LR448 efficacy test um, on it. Um, uh, basically, it's just 60 millilitres of, of the actual product, and that goes off. And the efficacy testing, that's just an example of one of the results that we get from, from the lab we use in Oxfordshire. So um, normally when we buy the dispersant from the supplies, it's normally around some, somewhere in the 90% mark. The, the pass mark is 45%. Uh, so with the stocks that we do, we do hold, it's, it's something around 50 million US dollars worth of stock in, in, in 12 locations. So we're very keen, to, it's, a, it's a huge asset of, of the company, so we're very keen to sort of maintain it as best as we can, uh, obviously for the effectiveness of, of an incident. Um, so this is, this is just one example, and then you see on there the, 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 the results are in the 90s, but overall, on average, it's 90.4% effective of all of our stocks to date. And that's really to do with the fact that we store it correctly. Um, it's stored under cover, out of direct sunlight, and out, out of extreme temperatures. So temperatures do make a difference. We've noticed in some of the dispersants that are stored in very hot countries or very cold countries or in bulk storage, it does decrease the efficacy of the dispersant. So all we can do is store it as best we can and hope, hope for the best for the future. So at the moment, it's in, in a good, good, good state of affairs. And um, finally, that's it. That, that's our any questions. Uh, otherwise, George and I are around all day, so we're more than happy to take any questions. So thank you very much. <laughs>
No, it never was 100%. Yeah. None of these products on the LR448 test, for example, would deliver 100% efficiency. Can I have a quick question? Oh. So I think it's wrong to assume that it's actually gone down to 90%. Yeah. That's not the case. It started, oh, it started off at that. Um, can you hear me? So, yeah. yeah, it started off at that uh, sort of level. So it hasn't really decreased. Yeah, it's a really good result. Yeah, that was a good result. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Kelly, I'll give you okay. one statement. <laughs> I just have a quick uh, statement <laughs> about the nitrogen blanket. Um, is that for all the dispersants or just or just mainly for correct? Because there's not volatile compounds in there. No, we do, we do find but one of our particular types, it does the, the oxygen in headspace does absorb absorb into the It was only that one particular type. We do it across the board just to keep it a nice and uh, in a uh, environment. So we used to get ones which were collapsing in, especially when they went away on higher in a hot oh, container. And you come back and then they were collapsed. You couldn't even get to the cap. It was that wow. bad. And they were cracking on the corner. So since we've nice and blanketed it, all, all of them, we don't get any 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 low pressures in there at all. So it's, it seems to work. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Jeff.